Uh, uh, my name is Ryan Arthur. Uh, I work for NCDIT Transportation GIS Unit. I'm Eric Wilson. I work for GU Decisions, and I work with Ryan on Project Atlas. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of people in the audience that actually are helping us make this crazy project happen. Um, so, you know, shout outs to, to Manasee, Michael, um, Caitlin, um, every, you, know, you know who you are. Thank you. Yeah, guys. DOT people too. DOT there's people. There. Thank you. All the folks out there. Yep. <laughs> All right, so yep, we're here to talk to you about Project Atlas uh, to improve project development uh, using GIS. So I always start with a slide, and if you were downstairs earlier today and saw Caitlin's uh, presentation with the, the work that they're doing, uh, GeoDecisions is doing uh, with planning at, in Durham, or if you saw Austin Chamberlain's uh, from NCDOT, his presentation on the TOPS application, you saw part of the project delivery process at NCDOT. Um, this is kind of the full um, the full bore tip to tail um, of the the process. So you know, I'll just reiterate, and it's I always look at this every time, almost any time I'm looking at you know our project or other projects I'm working at, or working on at the agency that I need to understand the context of of where we are. Um, so of course we start with planning, and and those plans happen you know decades out in advance. You have planning or organizations throughout. The state uh, looking at future needs. Um, those projects can be, you know, cut up and, and uh, entered in the prioritization process, and um, they'll use uh, an application that that we uh, maintain in our unit called Spot Online. Um, and those uh, those projects will be um, uh, prioritized and and looked at um, to understand uh, if if those meet the criteria. Those pro uh, projects would be. Um, looked at against the budget, and um, the ones that make it to the top will be funded. Um, after the project has been funded, that's where um, you know a, a, a lot of work happens. That's project <laughs> development and environmental analysis. And that's where a lot of the NEPA and SEPA work happens. They got to understand the environmental impacts and human environmental impacts to, to really nail down what the design of the road's going to be. All that stuff leads to design, which also leads to property acquisition. What kind of, you know, do we need to acquire right away to make this uh, project happen? And then we have construction. And the last thing I don't have on there is, you know, maintenance and uh, reporting. Just a, a reminder of how NCDOT measures up and what we're dealing with. You know, we're the second largest um, DOT uh, for uh, road, uh, road miles maintained. So, you know, we've got a big organization. Um, how did Atlas get started? Well, in August 2017, the Environmental Analysis Unit here at uh, NCDOT approached GIS Unit to, to help make uh, project delivery more efficient. Um, you know, the Environmental Analysis Unit, they've got some really sharp folks over there doing uh, uh, modeling uh, to understand where, um, well, pred predictive modeling to understand where species might be. Uh, they're doing wetland modeling. They're doing a lot of impressive stuff. Uh, they know GIS and they know how powerful it can be, and they know um, that we need to improve and streamline the project development process in order to uh, get projects out there faster, and in order to build better projects that have a less of an impact, less of a negative impact, and a better positive impact. So, Project Atlas fits in this uh, project development and environmental analysis uh, uh, phase of project delivery. You know, this is this is where we're focusing on. So, you know, our project is, is focusing on streamlining after a project's been funded. Um, that process of environment, um, uh, kind of understanding the impacts, um, doing the NEPA and SEPA work. Um, that's where our project is focused, and that kind of aligns with the secretary's priorities. Uh, that they laid out, um, which is uh, streamlining project development using GIS tools and applications and data. Um, we need to improve pro uh, program delivery overall, and you know, accelerated program uh, project delivery has strong impact for for the state as a whole. So this is the current state of project development. I think this is the current this is the current step, and there's about 1,400 projects. So. We've got a lot of projects that are going to be going through this environmental analysis phase. And then we have even more projects in the next phase. So um, just for context, yeah. um, in terms of projects, we're a rather large entity in terms of projects in the nation. We run at about, like Ryan was saying, somewhere around you know, 1,600, 1,700 projects. 
in the SNP at any one time, where a state like Utah is down around 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. So even though they maintain most of their roads, they don't have a lot of projects in the SNP. And so from where we're coming from, we're trying to manage a ton of projects coming through the system and trying to capture all that spatial data. And while they have a system that does it too, it's not used at the same level. And so when we're getting ideas from them, you know, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. for different states to relate to one another because we're so big. Yeah, and that does till into our next slide and and this is kind of a, a, a you know this is what it looked like for Eric and I to uh, kind of get on the project we had no idea really what we were dealing with uh, like Eric said you know the first thing that we kind of did was you know what have other DOTs done he mentioned Utah we talked to Florida DOT uh, we talked to PennDOT I mean I think I called help desks I just went straight into it like I, I you know, I was trying to find people, but I called the help desk for an application that I found. Um, just trying to understand what they've done, uh, you know, what ideas can we use uh, and what's possible. Um, major question for me is, you know, what does expediting project delivery really mean? And isn't everything that we do at NCDOT project delivery? I, you know, very major questions. Who's involved and where's the data to support, support this? Those are the key ones there. So a lot of people are involved. Uh, we've got people uh, working on wet, wetlands and streams, all the way through uh, protected species to um, you know bicycle and pedestrian planning, and yeah, we kind of touch. Uh, yeah, just a word about NEPA, SEPA. Like it's the National Environmental Policy Act, so it impacts both the natural environment and the human environment. And so each of these groups kind of attaches to one of those particular things. So like if you're in utilities, right away bicycle, pedestrian, community studies, that's more human environment. But if you are in sort of like sweeping environmental or protected species, wetlands and streams, you're dealing with most of the natural environment. And so Ryan and I, we didn't know how these groups were constructed at the DOT and how they fit into the business process. And the scary part about it was there wasn't a lot of documentation about that in general. What there was was a essentially a tip-to-tail process that they laid out in like Microsoft Project, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, managed out of the software called SAP. And so what we had to do was kind of decode that stepwise process into an actual flow and identify dependencies mm -hmm. and which components of that work used which data. Yeah, that, that's the current state of project development. So we've, we don't have um, true standards for required deliverables. Uh, we don't have a central repository for uh, the spatial data that's associated with those deliverables that I'm talking about. We do, There, the NC NCDOT does have um, a SharePoint site that has all funded projects in there. Um, so each funded project has its own page and it has folders for different uh, like uh, Word or Word or PDF documents. So they have that, and so that's good. That's a, that's a good thing that we can, we can connect to that, we can build on that. Yeah, so imagine if you've got a road that you're mm -hmm. being built and you have currently all the different people are doing all their different activities, but at the end of the day, they submit a PDF. And all the spatial data that goes into all the maps that build up all those reports is essentially just becomes a piece of paper. And so Pro Project Atlas is really trying to do is identify how that project moves through, when the spatial data gets identified and captured, and then what we can do is then mm -hmm. latch onto that and get it into the enterprise mm -hmm. so we can recycle it. Yeah. So we met with everybody that was part of this. Um, uh, on other uh, slide decks, I've had, um, you know, I have uh, several slides showing all the whiteboarding sessions that we had, but we just have these two pictures. Uh, we did this many, many times with many different groups um, and deconstructed the process to understand, you know, you know what, what data is coming in, who are you communicating with, are you passing a, 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 an export off to another group, are you using email to do that, trying to understand this whole um, com complicated process. So, you know, took the, the, the whiteboard diagrams, put them into uh, standard BPMN diagrams. So with that, an overall picture was taking shape. So just by October 2017, we had 80 interviews with business units across the agency. I mean, Eric and I and our team, we were driving back and forth between different offices. We were just on the run for a long time trying yeah. to understand this. Um, so, you know, our understanding is, you know, there are deficiencies um, and, you know, with different, many different aspects, um, not just the data itself. Because when we first came on, we were, we were just thinking, oh, you know, uh, we need to get data and we need to get the data out there. There was a little bit more going on and we could have a bigger impact. Um, and then also that project managers need better information before a project begins and when the project is um, moving through uh, project development. So this is, this is a simplified uh, picture of the complicated process. Um, 
And I mean, at the top we can see we've got um, we've got CTP, we got the planning, we've got prioritization of spot there, and we've got feasibility design, which we actually are tying into a little bit. That um, helps feed STIP where a project gets funding, and then we've got this breakout here uh, in green, and that is uh, project development. Right, and so like most of the uh, work that we did in those diagrams, the one that Ryan showed you just a minute ago that was the, the BPMN, each one of those is one of these blocks. And so as the process itself kind of comes through from the top, like Austin had given his presentation earlier, and also Caitlin, that's sort of that long range development process. And once it gets out of that funding box, so that box, that last one that says STIP, is really where the project becomes a real entity. And then it drops into this world. The real goal of this part of the project is at the end to get to a decision about the environmental impacts, whether there's really no impacts, whether there's a, a finding of no significant impact, or you actually have to do an environmental impact statement. And in order to do this process here, normally it takes anywhere from six months to eight years. And so there was a goal that was given to us in the beginning to make the process for a categorical exclusion be one year, two years, or three years. And right now it was way high. It was like three years, seven years, nine years. Yeah. It was really bizarrely high. Mm -hmm. And so they were having this conflict of how do we get that time down? And so that was also kind of our running mantra in the back, like cut the time down. Yep. Um, that kind of led into some other things. Uh, and when I was talking right in the beginning, I was talking about understanding context of where we are in the situation. And, you know, we just diagrammed out, you know, what um, what uh, we diagrammed at the top. Uh, he, we were, this is trying to represent our IT system and business processes and who's involved. And just to give us understanding of, like, who would we need to integrate with, uh, you know, what system is supporting what thing. Right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so here you can see that this, this little, whoa, shit. <laughs> this little thing here is uh, project development, right? This middle box is, and so up there you can see all the little boxes here, the different divisions within DOT that are working on project development. This is analogous to that green box before. And then once you hit here, you start to look at the systems that they're hitting. And so they're hitting some enterprise systems with enterprise data. We're introducing Atlas, which kind of goes across all the stages. And then there's the SAP module we were talking about before, which is sort of like their system of record. And then they have these other things that support that effort, like SharePoint, the scoping site, and pre-construction site, and then project-wise. So all these different systems are out there. Atlas, we're adding to it and providing an enterprise GIS link across that entire thing, where before there was no enterprise GIS across the entire operation. Um, uh, getting back to the beginning too, I mean, when we were asking a simple question of like what data is involved, this is a, a first shot of us looking at, um, you know, just three deliverables. So we got a traffic forecast on the right hand side. We got a preliminary design report that uh, hydraulics unit does, and we've got uh, NRTR, which EAU does. Um, but on the right hand side, like I said, those are the those are the deliverables. On the left hand side, we we were just looking for the source data, mm -hmm. and so you can just see from this simple diagram, you know how dependent um, we are in doing those deliverables. You know how dependent we are on uh, other state agencies, not just DOT. You know they're pulling data from um, you know Natural Resources Conservation Service. They're doing uh, pulling data from NCDEQ, um, DOT, and USGS. But and then this is kind of the makeup now. Um, so we've got quite a lot of data um, that we're looking at. I mean, we've got 27 agencies uh, that we've cataloged, uh, 54 root web service locations. That's a fun one. Um, so we're looking really at, you know, almost 600 um, web services. And again, we're looking at web services because one of the things that we found out um, is that, you know, the, the, the project teams and uh, firms working on the deliverables for one project might be pulling different data, um, you know, if they're working on a different project or other firms are pulling different things. So, you know, we want them also to not be downloading, you know, a firm might only be working on a certain deliverable. We don't want them going off and downloading all their data and putting it on their hard drive and then just pumping out that deliverable you know, for the next two years without going back and updating their data. Right, especially in regards to something like wetlands or streams where when a project is progressing, they will go ahead and do a stream delineation. Well, if you just use the USGS 1 of 24,000 streams, you get one answer. But once a project is completed in that area, because these projects tend to stack up on each other over time, each project has additional data to provide. 
And so that stream may have been delineated once before. And so what we wanted to do was capture that to get a really accurate level of impact for anything that was um, you know, in the area. So where we might use one to 24,000 streams if we don't have a streams layer, but if we do have a previously delineated one from other project, then we can use that. And so that data is also in this uh, list of data that we're using. Yep, that's the, the breakdown up close. Again, uh, deliverables on the right-hand side and then source um, data on the left. And then a further breakdown. So, you know, we've got a lot of data coming from uh, federal. Um, we got a little bit of data coming from local and quite a bit coming from our um, sister state agencies. And then here is a look with NCDOT involved. And then is this before, sorry, I'm having a sidebar. Is this before or after the, the, the data that we're publishing now through Atlas? This is after the data. Okay, yeah, so th through Atlas, um, NCDOT is gonna make up a, a pretty significant portion of the state data as, as compared to before. Again, that's that. That's the 130 new uh, layers that we're going to be creating and publishing out. Um, so some of that data is coming from environmental predictive modeling. Um, some of that's captured um, during a, a project going through project development. So that's per project. And then uh, we've got newly created data just to support that. Right, so a quick word about the predictive modeling data. That's data that for Project Atlas is being developed to uh, assess whether or not a particular type of feature exists in an area. So take, for example, a particular type of sunflower. There's a few sunflowers in the state of um, North Carolina that are protected. And so what we have done with the predictive modeling is we have uh, the sweeping environmental group and the T&E group have gotten together and they have built models in R and also expert models in ArcGIS toolbox. And essentially what they do is they take the data um, initially with the data sets they have from the state or the locals or the EPA, et cetera, and they built a, a first cut at the predictive model. But as Project Atlas starts to go along and it develops these additional layers and they start to snowball and grow, that predictive model is then run again and run again and run again. And so you end up with a much tighter model so that when an engineering firm or um, an environmental firm goes out to do work on a project, they don't have to spend all that time trying to look across the entire study area. They can use the predictive modeling layers to focus on a very particular area and not waste a lot of time. Also, that is an agency approved method. So all those predictive models have been passed through Fish and Wildlife Service, the Corps of Engineers, so that they have bought in to the idea that this predictive modeling is allowing that work to happen and be more efficient. All right, so um, while we had the major goals I talked about before, um, like improving uh, project delivery and streamlining it, um, we had our own goals as part of the GIS and application development team. So you know, number one, we wanted to provide uh, this, this community with a, a gateway to get to all that spatial data in an easy way, as opposed to, they were going to crazy sources, you know, going from one website to another and... Yeah, you know, calling people on the phone and asking yep. for the latest cut of the yep. data. An email comes across as a zip file and ends up in one guy's machine and then the other guy calls another guy and then calls a girl and then they end up distributing this data set around. Yep. They all have it on their machine for the past five years and it's been replaced three times online. Yep, so we just wanted to provide one uh, central place <laughs> yeah. for that uh, data. We also want to create a, a, a tool that can help uh, screen um, uh, transportation projects against spatial data for significant impacts. And then we also want to provide a platform for the project managers and project teams to kind of better understand and manage their projects. Um, and, and then of course we needed to, to do some kind of, you know, stand up a SDE and, and create some data. Right. From goals to tools, um, so uh, through this effort, um, you know, the, the searchable gateway, that's our search tool. Um, and then the screening tool, <laughs> is we're calling it the Atlas screening tool. That's, yeah, that's what it is. Um, and, and then we've got the Atlas workbench and that is our management tool. Right, so from, from your benefit, the search tool will allow you as an NCID user, so anybody in this room can get an NCID, which means you will have access to all the data that we have compiled that's not secure data available to you to search through and locate. You will be able to search and locate all the data, I'm rephrase that. So if you wanna see, does NCDOT have um, wetlands data or cemeteries data or shelter data, you'll be able to find that and you'll be able to use the same data that the project professionals at NCDU to use to evaluate your project. So all of you will have the ability to find that data, search it and download it if you want. It's downloaded from web services, so within your project area you can do so. The screening tool is for people who are actually working on projects, so if you are a clear NCDOT mm -hmm. employee, you'll be able to use that tool and the same with the workbench. Or if you're on a firm, if you're, if you're uh, part of a firm that has, is 
has won the bid to work on that project. Right, right. And government MPOs, RPOs yep. in this area yep. also from the, the screening tool mm -hmm. available as well. All right. So I'm going to go over some of the tools here. So um, again, the key functionality of our search tool is searching for that data. Um, and download, we, we, did we, yeah, we need, yeah, that's a bad one, GDB. Um, so, and we can, uh, we allow folks to, that's, yeah, sorry. Uh, we allow folks to download the data in different formats. Um, and uh, the, we can also allow folks to view the data on, a, on the web map to make sure that they're picking the data that, that they wanted to. Right. So th this is our homepage. We got this um, set up on our test environment right now. Um, so we give you uh, options when you're coming in. Uh, first of all, you can search by document, and when I hit that, the, it's a it's a drop down. And it has all the documents and that are required deliverables for project development and CDOT. So you can go in and you can say, hey, you know, I'm on this project. Um, I'm tasked with doing the error or noise report, and yeah. I want that data for that um, for that deliverable. And I can go in, I can select that, I can hit search, and boom, I've got my data, and I'm ready to roll on doing that report. Right, and the nice part about that is, like, you'll know that some of the web services have restrictions on the size of the amount of data that you can pull down. Our tools allow you to kind of surpass that. So if it's like, you know, flim capped at a thousand. Our tool can come in and reiterate on it and get you the 1,500 records mm -hmm. or 1,700 records in that study area. But because we limit the size of the study area, we are um, not really abusing the services. So that's yeah. one important thing as well. Yep. Uh, we've got a search by organization. We can search by keyword. And we can also search by a combination of all of those. So after, um, I believe this, was this NRTR? We have two minutes. Okay. okay. Well, and then I'll run through that. Okay, so um, we can see the, the metadata for, for the project, or for this data, and we can view the data, and then uh, we can change the base maps, uh, we can do some simple um, uh, web map tools, and we can download the data. Our screening tool, um, right now, uh, we're actually looking at 134 layers that, can, um, that we can screen against, and that can, that can change. We built the system to be flexible, a tool that I have not mentioned yet that is being, um, that is coming out is our administration tool, which will allow um, the the business and subject matter experts to, to change or add uh, data to different parts of the application. And so we allow the users to screen uh, by project idea. You can go in and screen um, the STIP. Uh, you can upload a study area, or you can draw in a study area. Um, this is an example of somebody selecting by project ID of an existing STIP project. When they select that, um, the, they will next have a chance to buffer that project. That's the building of the study area. Um, once you do that, you can go in and select the data sets that you'd like to screen against. You can set fields, and this is going into the fact that our screening tool produces the PD, a PDF report that outlines all of your impacts and quantifies them. Um, so in this screen, I can go in and I can further define or make my report a little bit more detailed. If I, you know, know the Sergo data very well, I can go in and say, hey, I want to break out the data and I want to get the, uh, the impacts for each of these different uh, values. So here I'm building or I'm running the screening report after naming it and giving it a description. Here is my results. So I've got 14 impacts, hi uh, impacts highlighted in, in blue here. And then I can download that data, and then we've got an example of the PDF. Um, in this report, you know, we've got we've got our, our map in the upper right. We've got a uh, buffer size. We've got which step it was. Below that, we've got a summary of potential impacts, and this is just a quick hit: yes or no. Do I have uh, issues in conservation areas? Do I have issues in fish and aquatics? And then below, we have the breakdown of all the data. Um, and then so we give you counts. And we give you total coverage and we give you nearest. And all of that is important for somebody that is working on a project because certain things like, um, I don't know if it's 303 streams, but certain streams, certain uh, wetlands, if you are impacting more than two square acres of a wetland, that means you have to have a certain um, uh, permit with a Corps of Army or Army Corps of Engineers. So this is very important. And, and before, uh, this kind of work would have been handed off to a firm. Um, now, uh, project managers and project teams um, at NCDOT can, can quickly run this and kind of get the overall picture of what they're facing. Um, and then as they work on the project, which dovetails in the workbench, as they work on the project, they're going to be gathering data. And this is where we're going to be harvesting data. So you can run the search tool again after you've gathered data because the, the data that we'll be gathering through working on the project in the workbench is being fed back in through web services. Yep, and as the workbench works, um it's magic. Uh, uh, projects kind of run asynchronously, so you have 
people collecting human data, you have people collecting environmental data, and that data starts to funnel in. So what the workbench does is allows you to control that flow um, and also manage whether or not the deliverables are coming in according to a standard, because that's one of the big deals we have a SharePoint right now is that people submit their data into SharePoint and it's all over the map as far as quality and consistency goes. So what the workbench does is it provides the ability to review the data as it's coming in, tell the user whether or not they met the schema, whether they're clear or not, take the data in, evaluate the geometry and stuff, give them a thumbs up, thumbs down, then we take the data in and we store it as a record in SharePoint and then we push the geometry over into SDE and then we are able to access it from there. Yep. So this is a quick example of uh, our SharePoint site. Every project that has been funded has this. Um, so here we've got our uh, Atlas tools that are available there. Um, once you hit the workbench from this page, so right now I'm working on my U5834. I want to go in and I want to submit some data. Or I want to um, update some, some stuff in my project. So I hit workbench. I, I come to the map where my data is. I, I uh, go over and I hit workbench up on the top. It's a modular um, application. And then uh, what I can do is I have a decision type of tr a decision tree. I've got a workflow of, of my project from tip to tail. So, you know, we've got our scoping meeting outlined. I can answer questions. I can upload the spatial or the uh, PDF uh, document data, and that will be dropped in back into SharePoint. And then I can also upload the spatial data that is corresponding to that deliverable. That data will actually, this is kind of a mock-up of that, but the spatial data on the bottom right here I have uploaded my spatial data. Um, it, then we have a GP service uh, that checks the Q, it does a QA QC, make sure the scheme is right, um, make sure it's named correctly, and that gets appended to the data set in our uh, enterprise uh, GIS database. Um, and then that actually will get replicated over to our publication one, and then it'll be pushed out. Can you go back one slide? Yep. One thing that's important too is the colored check marks. This is really important from a project management perspective. One of the biggest problems that uh, DOT has at the moment is that they have a general feel of how a project is progressing, but they don't really know at all times what is slowing the project down. So as we take the deliverables in, we are able to then mark off what required documents have made it in, which part of the projects have been started, which projects have been elected to be bypassed. And so at any one time, they can print out this entire thing and take a report with them yep. into the meeting with their boss and say, hey, are we on schedule, yes or no? Oh, I, why are we not on schedule? Well, we're having a problem with a natural resource technical report. We don't have this in there. Before, what happens is, the, well, currently what happens when they go into a meeting, the chief engineer or whoever it is will ask the project manager what's going on, and they will say, well, I feel good about the project or I feel bad about the project, but there's no metrics and no way for anyone in the chain of command to really understand whether or not the project is on track or not. It's all based on project manager feel. So this gives them a solid metric for how to do that and it allows them to be able to communicate across uh, yep. the platform. Yep. Um, and then like Eric had mentioned before, we're collecting this data per project. Um, yep. And so hopefully, you know, the, the idea is that it will snowball and we'll have, you know, um, quite a lot of data uh, across the state that uh, will help us make decisions better, help us screen projects later on that are, are more informed. Yeah, and one of the things that happens a lot with these applications, I mean, with current work too, is that the data that the engineers collect, some of the external agencies want that data, like the national uh, NHP or um, the, say, architecture office. Like, they send the data from the project they're working on over to there, and that becomes sort of the project uh, uh, the repository of record, mm -hmm. when really they need to keep that data at NCDOT as a record of what happened on the project itself, so it's not residing off-site in another agency. So that's mm -hmm. part of this effort, too, is to categorize exactly what was happened and be able to monopolize mm -hmm. on that uh, investment mm -hmm. of money. I think we're running out of time, but the and the, the last thing that we usually go over or would want to go over is our application management tool. The gist of that is uh, we've got uh, Michelle Worf who works for Environmental Analysis Unit, and she's our Atlas coordinator. And um, um, she and some others would have access to this application and be able to um, maybe add a, a new layer that somebody has found um, to uh, the uh, NRTR deliverable, for example, because those are the folks that know, you know, um, those, those folks are subject matter experts, they're environmental uh, scientists, um, they're the ones getting the memos that, you know, this yeah. is the new mandate that you need to be using this data set, um, right. considering that. And so, you know, we just built uh, an administration application for that purpose, so she can go in and she can update questions in the workbench, for example. And then uh, my the last 
note was that we're very dependent upon the state agencies, federal agencies, and local agencies. And you know, when things happen, when there's shutdowns, or when an agency can't um, keep its server up, there or for example, I mean, if ours went down, uh, we're not serving data out. And I'm just you know, make a note that it's important that we're they're sharing data and 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 doing our responsibility. Right. And so as those pro as the tools you saw are being worked on, and you're inside the tools, there's always communication with you as to whether or not the data is available or not. So if you run the screening report, it will tell you in the report, hey, they ran the screening report, these are your results, but this layer was down, this layer was unavailable, you may want to try that back. In the workbench, it's the same way. If you go to add data, it will tell you ahead of time if the data is up or down, and then you can actually, it hyperlinks you out to the web service mm -hmm. itself so you can verify. So it's, it, all three tools kind of pile on top of each other, but yet they are standalone as well. So mm -hmm. it's helpful. Yep. And then last notes, we're not eliminating the field work that was already um, being done. Not eliminating jobs. We're trying to make everything easier, um, and that's it. There you go. Yeah. Any questions? I'm just a little KCI. Pattern. That's good. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Questions about web service? Yeah. yeah. So, how hard was it to get agencies in the merger process? Correct. It was not easy, and that's the thing. Like we're just two IT guys. Mm -hmm. The people who did that work and provided that was the EAU, and then also the individual subject matter experts. They have met with folks like um, uh, Fish and Wildlife. They've met with um, whoever does NC Cruise. I can't remember who they are, but they go back or Fish and or Wildlife something. I, there's too, <laughs> there's there's too many. Right. But that work has is still ongoing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's been like, yes, we agree. It's more like, okay, run it. It doesn't look right. Do it again. And then yeah. we would, in terms of validating the data that is produced with the predictive models, there's been a whole separate field work effort as part of this, where we've had a firm, RK and K, going out at the direction of the agencies and at the direction of the DOT people to go out and field verify all the predictive results yeah. to make sure that they're okay. And so part of what we were able to do early on is to take all the existing NRTR study areas that have been done and run them through um, the predictive model as well. And so we knew that um, we had, what, 700 study areas. And in those 700 study areas, we knew that we had found um, sunflowers or um, some of the other And so we were able to use that to help refine those predictive models out of the gate. And so then um, once we had gotten that run through, it helped really refine that model nicely. And then um, we've been able to take uh, essentially running projects through it in, in a really cursory sense, like, hey, we're going to do this project, go out and validate that the predictive model worked or not, and then refine and figure out why it didn't work or did work. Mm -hmm. Some models have been shut down. So it's not like they were all like, oh, yeah, this is great. Some were like, that's crap. You know, so, you know. Yeah, it, we, we didn't mention, I forgot to mention that um, the, the subject matter experts and other folks that have been on the project that aren't on like the application team. There, we had 70 or so people that are involved. Right. So it's, it's a big effort, and we've got the, yeah. the right people involved to, to help out there. Yeah, some really cool data that's coming out. There'll be a brand new streams layer for the state that's um, going to replace the existing layer that's in the USGS. So DEQ is going to take ownership. So that's really cool. There's going to be a new cemeteries layer. There's going to be um, new adult education. There, there'll be the predictive mm -hmm. modeling layers that'll be available if you want to have access mm -hmm. to those. Um, and the, the individual layers for the projects, that seamless layer will be available to you to see as well. Um, and then we'll be feeding the secure data to NHP mm -hmm. and also to OSA. So there's communication there and, we'll, and we work tightly with them and helping them with their uh, services and stuff like that too. All right. So, okay. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you.